I've been involved in women's Bible study for over 20 years. It's really how I've grown in my faith, in a safe place with women of different ages, being able to share our stories, our lives, and our faith together as we grow closer to Jesus. Earlier this year, I had a time in my life in which I was really angry at God and I didn't want to specifically come to church, sorry. But I wanted to be with my friends. And so the women's Bible study for me is a chance for me to be with my friends and it was a safe place where I could be emotional and I could speak freely and without fear of judgment. And it was a safe place for me to be able to come and feel that I was at home. I think what makes it safe is that we know the women, are, the women in our groups aren't going to share outside of our group. It's kind of one of our guidelines to keep it safe so that we can be real, kind of the fully known, fully loved. My hope for women joining this study is that they find a place to connect and be able to share their story and be able to connect with another woman who's like, I've been through this, I've been through that, or, you know, I have a friend who's doing this, let me connect you with her. And it is an amazing group of women who are able to connect with each other and share and be able to relate to one another. We had one woman come last year who hadn't enjoyed women's Bible studies in the past because she felt like women were catty or gossipy, but she found that this really is a safe place to share our faith with one another and grow, come alongside each other. So my vision for this is that all women, no matter their age, no matter what they have gone through in their lives, whether they have kids, no kids, whether they are out of the parenting stage or trying to get into it, that they have a place that they feel that they belong and that they feel welcome and safe. So if I were talking to a woman and I am talking to you women in the audience. Um, just give it a try. The groups are warm and welcoming. We are very intentional about, um, about how we do this study, and we're gonna have times where we're gonna focus on prayer. And if you feel intimidated by prayer or you feel like you're brand new to the Bible, it doesn't matter because we've all been there. So you might have some preconceived ideas as to what a women's Bible study is. And while we do learn a lot from each other, we have a lot of great times together and a lot of great memories are made. Well, if that doesn't pique your curiosity, maybe you're not paying attention. That is a beautiful invitation into community. And I've got to witness this group of women that gather on Monday nights from afar, just watching them. And one thing that sticks out to me about this group of people is that they are truly committed to each other. And one of their members uh, had battling, been battling cancer. And to watch this community of women come around her, pray for her, support her, some of them online, some of them present, to sit with her and walk through the journey of her recovery process and her treatment was a tremendous gift for me to observe and watch. Directly after the gathering this morning, there will be a group of women over in the Connection Center. If you're interested in learning more about how to become part of this community and women in the word, they would love to sign you up, give you a little bit more direction on where they're headed and what they're doing this next year. So they are starting on September the 18th is their launch date. So if you are curious and wanna jump in, that's a great opportunity for you ladies in the room. My name is John, in case you're wondering who the heck is this guy up there talking with his orange pants. This is John, and I am the pastor of discipleship here at Ascent. And sometimes when I say I'm the pastor of discipleship, people's eyes gloss over and they go, what the heck is a pastor of discipleship and why should I care? Well, a disciple is somebody we get from the scriptures that has chosen to align themselves in the way of Jesus. Disciple could be translated as a student, as an apprentice, somebody who's set their life on a course to become more and more like Jesus. And this fall, we have a couple of new opportunities, some new pathways for you to jump on board to learn how to walk in the way of Jesus. The two offerings are circles, which I'll explain in a moment. And then we have a new endeavor, a new pathway called Life with God. But first of all, I wanna talk about this thing in my hand, an orange. Question for you, if I squeeze this orange, what kind of juice comes out of it? 
Yeah, I mean, duh, right? You hope at least orange juice comes out of it. No matter what I do with this orange, no matter how I try to manipulate it, no matter how I try to conceive this orange, every time I squeeze it, if I'm angry, if I'm happy, if I'm joyful, every time orange juice comes out of it. If I hope cranberry juice comes out of it, I probably need to check myself into a mental institution. Or cranberry juice is not gonna come out of this orange. Question for you. If you hand, let's say your life is an orange, and if you hand your orange to your neighbor that you don't care for, that you don't like, that hits your trigger buttons and stirs you up into all sorts of emotions, what comes out of you? If we were to squeeze you this morning, what would come out of you? When you're dealing with somebody who you perceive as an enemy or somebody who's irritating, when you get squeezed, what comes out of you? The circle journey that we have coming up on September the 25th begins to address what's going on in our inner life, in our inner world, and how do we learn how to pay attention to our character so that when we get squeezed in life, because life is going to squeeze you, what will come out is love, joy, peace, patience. So this circle journey that we're going to be looking at is addressing all of the inner world. How do we tune in? It's a safe environment. We've been through this journey two times now. This will be our third edition of this. And what I found is that as people come into this journey, they come from all different backgrounds. There are some who are all in with the Jesus story, and then there are some who are Jesus curious and wondering, is this something that I want to commit my life to? So again, it's a safe space. It's an easy entry point for you to enter into relationship and life here at Ascent. It's an eight-week journey, and that starts on the 25th on Monday nights. And this new pathway that we've created is called Life with God. We're starting a new deal called Life with God Groups. This is a 12-week commitment, and if you are interested in learning about how to become part of a Life with God group, jumping into deeper relationships with people in this room, and learning how to connect with God and one another, I invite you to jump on board. We have some trained leaders who are ready to take you through a 12-week commitment and experience. The beauty of this experience is that not only do you learn and you connect with others, but throughout the week, there are practices, spiritual practices that you develop, listening to podcasts, listening to scripture, learning how to meditate on the good things so that when life throws a curveball at you and you get squeezed, what comes out of you is more of the reflection and the heart of Jesus. So that's the journey, that's the hope, and I will be at the Connection Center after the service today, and a couple others will be with us. So if you are interested in learning more about how do I get involved in a group that's going to help me grow and become a more loving person, we want to help you find your place. All right? Are you with me? Good. Hey, last night in this building, lots of mayhem happened. Mo High had their homecoming experience in this building building. So if there was a faint smell of something that seemed off this morning, it's because of that. And I want to throw up a picture for you from last night. This is what happened in this space. And as we're just looking at this picture, I'm going to bring up Brother Mo, and Mo is going to bring the good word for us this morning. So Mo, step into this space, do what you do, get it done, and go with Jesus. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Ascendant. It's so good to be with you all today. Uh, like uh, Johnny mentioned, my name is Mo or Maurice. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Um, and I'm just so excited because, I mean, a uh, good day to be a buff again. I know I'm going to say it like every single week. Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in the building. I hear it. I hear it. Who got a chance to go to the Buffs game? Who got a chance to go to the Buffs game? Anybody? Anybody? All right, all right. I see who I need to be friends with. Okay, give me some tickets in the building. Okay, okay. Uh, I was thinking to myself, like, what am I actually going to do? You know, I was actually thinking to myself, um, one of these days for announcements, I'm just going to, like, dress up like Dion. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's going to be, like, the cowboy hat with, like, the puffy vest and then, like, the hoodie, or is it just going to be the hoodie with the blazer and the glasses? You know what I mean? And walk in like Dion. I'm still trying to convince Aisha to, like, you know, when I come in from work, um, I just get to say, play me my theme music. And she plays it. She's not having it. He's not having it. <laughs> maybe I convince my son, uh, O'Shea, four months old. Maybe he can uh, help me out, uh, play me my theme music. I think everybody should have theme music. You know what I mean? All right, enough about Dion. I I'm in this place right now where I'm, like, borderline thinking to myself, like, loving the craze and all the things about what Dion is doing and this sort of, like, constant reminder, like, Maurice, you're not 20 years old, okay? <laughs> like, it gets pretty bad when you start thinking to yourself, like, how many reps do I have left? You know what I mean? What's my eligibility like? You know, it's like, none, Maurice. 
your back hurts getting out of bed. You can't just stop thinking about it. Let it go. Let it go. I'm at that little crisis right now. <laughs> this morning, I get an awesome opportunity to continue on in our, serv- uh, in our service, uh, to continue on our series about uh, feelings. We've been in a series entitled All of the Feels. And it's been awesome to think through how we as a faith community navigate our emotions and our feelings. We find it important. I wrote a couple of notes down as I start to think about the recap of this entire series. Uh, That as a faith community, we find it important to discuss this particular topic. Because the Christian faith, despite some who are spewing a false message about God, is a faith that addresses the whole person. Like we are a Christian faith who addresses the totality of humanity. It's not just one part of you that this faith journey is all about. Like when in the church world, when we use terms like salvation or being saved, it's not just so that you can come and you can find a way of, I can make my way to heaven, this utopia in an afterlife. It's about a relationship with Jesus in the here and now. And it's a shalom. It's a harmony. It's a, we can actually engage in a peace and harmony down here on earth. It's good news now. It's a holistic vision. And to be a faith that addresses the whole person, that means that there is a holistic understanding that, yes, we are a faith community, but we are a people that will also address the things when it comes to our spiritual needs, our mental needs, our physical needs, and, yes, our emotional needs. Here's some of the premise of what we've been really getting at when it comes to our feelings and emotions. God has created us with emotions and feelings. Yes, even for all of you in the room who are strong, macho, I don't really feel anything. For some of you who may even question, is there something wrong with me? Like, I probably should be crying at certain moments in my life, and I don't find myself crying. God has created us with emotions, and it goes beyond just tears. I don't want to set it up in a way of emotions are just tears, but God has created us with emotions. However, his intention is not that our emotions would lead us. Emotions are good indicators, but not dictators. God's desire is that our emotions serve us. We don't serve them. We live with our emotions. We are not led by our emotions. So for the last several weeks, we have been discussing our faith journey in relation to our emotional well-being. And this is important because um, maybe just for some of you in the Christ, uh, Christians in the room, um, if you've had a particular background or upbringing, um, sometimes uh, for whatever reason we have discipled people, we have shaped people uh, to leave their mind at the door. And lots of faith communities have built a foundation on emotionalism. Or quite the opposite, where people walk in and it's only heady and intellectual. And you leave all the parts of your emotions and feelings at the door. We believe that God has created us as human beings with emotions, and there is an integration that must take place. Bill kicked us off in this sermon, our lead pastor Bill, and he started to talk about the feeling of loneliness and the feeling of being exhausted. Then last week, Aisha, who's my wife, who's a part of our uh, teaching team as well, she talked about the feeling of being inadequate. And this morning, it is my hope that we get to tackle, capture, and unpack and hopefully set us free from this trap, this sort of feeling of being offended, the feeling of offense. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we take this journey this morning? God, thank you for the emotions that you have given to every single one of us. I pray this morning, Lord, all of us have stumbled across being offended. Would you speak through me this morning? I pray, Lord, would you nudge somebody in the direction of a reconciliation this morning as we tackle what it means to be offended but not to stay offended. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Paul, a follower of Jesus, preacher, church planter, encourages us this morning from the book of Ephesians. He's writing a letter to a broad audience in the city and this town called Ephesus. And as he's writing this letter, I want to pick it up in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It reads this right here. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. 
And do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. This morning, as we tackle the emotion of offense, I have two points and an invitation. Two points and an invitation. I was doing some studying and I began to think to myself, um, maybe you're like myself and you begin to wonder. Uh, have you ever wondered how you will tell the story of 2020? Like, have you ever think that to yourself? How will you? My son is four months old. I think to myself, how am I going to tell the story of 2020? So much craziness taking place. I think of the same thing for my dad. I always talk to my dad every now and then and my uncles who was a little bit older. I'm like, summer of 69, when I got older and started learning about different things that was taking place, I'm like, what was that like? What was that? What, what, what took place? Like the way I see it in documentaries and read it in books, I'm like, in L.A., this is just, what were you doing? Like, how was that? I think the same thing for 2020. How will I tell of 2020. 2020 was one, uh, you all lived through it, you was there with me, um, and it was one that was tough, right? It, it was one that was full of all sorts of tension. It was full of this racial tension. It was full of all sorts of injustices. It was full of all sorts of uh, debates and, and debacles about vaccines and all these sorts of things around uh, the COVID and all, all sorts of stuff, political upheaval, every single thing. And it was this year that it was so much tension and division. You could just bring up any sort of topic and you'll find that people were offended. And if you'll be honest, that you probably were a part of a particular group that was offensive. I know for me, that exhausting, exhausting time during 2020, I had to really press pause because there was a particular group of people that became very offensive to me. Very offensive. Can I share with you this morning who that group of people was? I'm going to share with you who that group of people was. That group of people was people who wore their mask like this. <laughs> if you in this room was a part of this group of people, let me just tell you, you are the ones I have to pray for. Like this right here, and then talking to me. Like I'm thinking in my head as I'm talking to a person with their mask. Like whatever you think about it, whatever your, 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 your thing is, whatever you're, you're, you're upset about, whatever your thoughts are on Fauci, whatever. I, hey, wherever you land, that's fine. But commit, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to be here, you're going to be here. And then the one that just had it here as if it was a fashion statement, like, <laughs> you're just walking around with it on your chin. Like, what are we doing? Like, what is this? This group was very offensive to me. I got to be honest with you. Who am I talking to this morning? I'm talking to my grandpa. My grandpa was one who just sat like this. I mean, in the older demographic, very vulnerable. And I'm like, bruh. He's one also who has like, you know, when he talks, it's kind of like you can't really even without the mask hear what he's saying. And then you're talking to him like this and it's like, everything I heard, the only word I heard was boy. Oh, boy, give me that over there. Boy, I told you that, get my face fine. It's like, Papa, what in the world is going on? That, that group of people was offensive. And while we laughed this morning, let's be all honest, uh, that we all have come across whether it was a group of people or we was that person ourselves, this feeling of offense. This morning, Paul encourages us and actually helps us to navigate what it means to tackle this feeling of offense. It's interesting because as I walked through this and I began to do some studying even for this particular sermon, I realized that offense was a little bit the, the thing that was the source. It was underneath it all. What do I mean by that? See, I always thought that anger was my problem, right? Verse 26 says, do not be angry. Let go of all bitterness, rage, and anger. I've always thought it was anger. And as I got closer to this topic, I began to recognize, and through conversations with my spiritual director and all sorts of things, that anger is rarely a primary emotion. That anger is actually a symptom and not the root of it. And it caused me to start thinking, what if I was a person who became angry and asked another question, what is really going on? 
See, sometimes we think that it's anger, and anger, I heard one pastor put it this way, it's sort of the indicator, it's the light uh, on your dashboard when you're driving your car and it tells you something underneath the hood is wrong. But what we do is, is we attack the symptom. And uh, the analogy that he used was, um, in some ways, what we do is we see the indicator light, uh, stop the car, go into the trunk, grab a hammer, and bang the light, and crash the light, and turn the light off. And then we think that the problem is solved uh, because we've only taken care of the symptom. This morning, I don't want to just deal with the symptom. I want to talk about what's underneath that. And I think what's underneath sometimes for me and maybe even for you is this feeling of being offended. As I read a book, there was a particular psychologist who writes books for uh, the faith uh, organization called InterVarsity. She said, common reasons that all of us either feel angry or get, or get offended. Someone cuts you off in line. Someone misunderstood what you said ignored your feelings, a breakup in a relationship. Someone lied to you, you feel trapped, smothered, or out of control. You feel like a failure. Someone broke your trust, a long checkout line. The waitress brought you the wrong food. McDonald's, I hate you. Your spouse, your spouse runs out and has been unfaithful. You run out of time and don't have time to finish your checklist. You were in a hurry, but, it hit all, but you hit all of the red lights. You find out too late that you ran out of toilet paper. That was a funny one. Someone tracked dirt in the house as soon as you cleaned it. The driver in front of you is going really, really slow, and people in your home continue to move your cell phone chargers. <laughs> this was a part of the list from a psychologist. We all have this feeling that we are offended, that something took place, that a boundary was crossed, that something is unfair. And isn't it interesting that this feeling of offense is really rooted in this thought, in this, 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 uh, this sentiment of justice. It's this sort of justice-oriented nature where something has been wronged and I feel a certain type of way. This morning, I want to talk about what it means to be a community that lives unoffendable. And what I mean by unoff unoffendable is not to say that you will never get offended. But living unoffendable means that you won't stay offended. The note that I wrote down was, to become offended is human. But to stay offended is a choice. And to be a people that is unoffendable, here's two points. Point number one, I believe from our text this morning, we have to recognize that we have an enemy and he has a plan. Recognize that we have an enemy and he has a plan. It's quite interesting that as I read the passage this morning, uh, initially as I was doing some studying and I was going through and I was looking at all the list of anger, rage, bitterness, and all these things, and I read all through it, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, and I'm kind of like dissecting this, and I'm going through the, 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 the cultural uh, 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 background, and I'm going through all of these things, the exegesis, and other things that's taking place, and the homiletics, and all these words, right, all these seminary words, these big things that's taking place, the study that has to, take ha that has to happen for you to actually capture what the writer is intending to say. I go through this whole process, and initially, as I'm reading all of this, I missed out on the third-party character that was in the text. Initially, as I read this, I'm just going forth and I'm looking at the list of anger, rage, bitterness, all these things. And as I begin to recognize and I begin to slow myself down, I begin to see and Paul subtly inserts, and don't let the devil have a foothold in your life. A saint church, I believe that we are a people who are, have a faith in God and we press towards God and we have a relationship with God and all of the things because God stands for love and justice and mercy and grace and all of these things. But we have to also recognize that there is an enemy in this world. That beyond just the physical nature in a spiritual realm, we have an enemy. And we don't usually use that term and that talk anymore. When it comes to devil, when it comes to the devil, when it comes to Satan, there is a opposite force. There is a opposite energy. There is a opposite person against who God is, and Scripture talks about him. And I think sometimes the faith community, when we try to swing one direction of not talking about Satan uh, because we don't want to give him too much power, it's like, yeah, well, I get that. Jesus defeated him on the cross. But we have to also be mindful, uh, don't e eradicate Satan and his enemy and in his uh, a uh, plan altogether. Scripture talks about him this way in 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Ephesians chapter 6 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and his, in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes. Jesus goes on to say these words in John 10, 10, the thief, which is Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Uh, Saint Community Church, we have an enemy. And what I love about Paul as he's writing, he's talking about our emotions. And then he says, but don't let the enemy have a foothold. Don't let the devil get a foothold in your life. When it comes to the offense and the feeling of offense, there is a third party at play. And as I was doing some beginning, some, uh, some particular word study and beginning to look at what uh, Paul is writing when he says, uh, do not let the devil have a foothold, uh, what he is saying here, that word foothold is topos in the Greek. Say topos. Can you say topos with me? Topos. All right. Interactive. I want to say it one more time because that was kind of weak, y'all. Topos. All right. All right. All right. That was a little better. That was a little better. T-O-P-O-S. Topos in the Greek. It means actually a, literally a room, like a place for Satan. And I begin to think about what it means for us in our life and what our lives look like when we have unaddressed offenses in our life. I'm actually going to have Zeeland, one of our uh, people who works here at our church. Zeeland, come on up to the stage. We're actually going to have just a little bit of a prop and go into detail here. Uh, Zeeland, as much as I love you, brother, you are Satan this morning, all right? Go ahead. This is going to be Satan, okay? This is Satan this morning. And it's not like I have a particular uh, scenario, and this is just a hypothetical situation, y'all. So I'm going to take a hypothetical scenario of a young couple who just had a baby, and they've moved here from California, Okay. (laughs) So, uh, you know, Zeeland, you're getting comfortable, all right? You're getting comfortable. This is the room, right? When we have unaddressed situations, we have unaddressed offenses in our life, there is a third party at play. And we have to recognize that the devil is doing something in our lives. So here's the deal. When I come home, I come home from work, and I kiss the baby before I kiss my wife, and that goes unaddressed, upset. She's upset. Come on, Zeeland, get up. Zip, get up. We don't address that, and there's a problem. So Zeeland's going to get comfortable because we've got to make, you know, the enemy real comfortable. He's making a home in our lives. Here we go. There we go. Zeeland put on the, the, the robe. Uh, uh, it's probably too small for Zeeland. All right, no worries. <laughs> there you go, Zeeland, get comfortable. There we go. I come home, and I kiss my son. Not my son. Excuse me. I kiss the, this person. Kiss this is the son before he kisses the wife. And, and there's an offense. And there's a problem that's going on. So now we got tension in, in the building. But then we keep moving on. And now, you know, because we're Christians, um, you know, there's this silent treatment. And we don't, really, we don't really cuss at each other. It's just kind of like slamming doors. You know what I mean? Just like really tightly. You know what I mean? So now people are slamming doors in this hypothetical house. So we're slamming doors. It's just unaddressed, right? So now we're letting the enemy get real comfortable. There you go. Yes, enemy. There you go. There you go. So, so on, on my way home, no, excuse me, on this person's way home, uh, they decided to, you know what, I stopped at Starbucks, and I'm going to get my spouse a cake pop. I'm going to get my spouse a cake pop, right? And I'm going to get my spouse a cake pop because I want to get my spouse a cake pop. I was thinking about my spouse, the spouse, not me. I was thinking about the spouse. So I make my way home, and I make my way home all the way to this place, and I'm like, you know what, to break up the tension, I'm going to just go ahead and say, you know what, I was thinking of you, I got you this cake pop. So I give you this cake pop, and the response to me giving the cake pop is, you must not know me. I don't eat cake pops. A fence. There's a fence. There's a fence. Get real comfortable. You take your soda, have your chips. A fence is happening and it's going unaddressed because in my mind or this person's mind, they're thinking, I don't know you. I know you for 10 years, eight years married. Your mama don't know you. I know you more than your parents know you. I know you because I know what you like. I know what your parents like. I know all these things about you. I know you. Okay. And then a fence happens. And then more and more as we go on, it goes unaddressed. And then days go by. And all the while, I'm thinking to myself, as there is a fence, as there is things boiling up within us, and they've gone unaddressed. I wonder, how have you gone about your problems and gone about the feelings of being offended when it comes to the third party? Like, I want you to go ahead, keep eating, drinking, Zila. I want you to, like, think about it. Like, sit in this place and you are going to your family gatherings and there's a third party. You're having a phone conversation with your in-laws and all the while in the background, there's a third party. These situations that come up when we are offended as a faith community. I'm talking to those of you in the room who call yourselves Christians. Those of you who are followers of Jesus. I want you to know uh, that there is a spiritual realm. 
and that we don't play when it comes to the enemy because Jesus talks about him very, very fiercely. And all the while in our lives, in the background of our lives, in the background of our marriages. Where's the camera? I want to sit right here. In the background of our marriages, there is a third party. In the background of our friendships, there is a third party. In the background of our social media feed, when there is this battle that's going on and we're trying to defend our points because we feel so offended, are you noticing the third party? Paul tells us, do not give the enemy a foothold. Because when you do, he makes room in your heart. And he makes room in our communities. And he makes room in our churches. And he makes room in our world. And all the while we're trying to preach about Jesus, when we have unaddressed offenses, there's a third party in the background. Have you addressed the third party when it comes to your family? Have you addressed the third party when it comes to your friendships? Have you noticed that there is a enemy and his plan has always been division? This is the scenario that I always bring up. I had the awesome opportunity of not only being a teaching pastor, but being a pastor of racial reconciliation and within our justice and mercy ministry. And even in my own walk, especially when we talk about 2020, right, all the different things, God had to convict me with all of the conversations that are taking place that are necessary. Don't you forget that there's an enemy. That whenever you get to a point where you start thinking to yourself, those people, that whenever you start getting to yourself and you start categorizing groups of people and othering them, That whenever you get to a point where you start talking about the blacks or the whites or the Asians or the Jews or all of whatever you want to use, whatever terminology, whatever that may be, we're leaving room for a foothold for the enemy. And it is always my endeavor whenever you encounter the work that we are doing here at Ascent to recognize what the scripture says when we say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle with principalities in dark places. That it is not just those people that we're looking at. Actually, it is behind it. There is a source behind it at play, and it is bringing division in our world. Do you recognize the third party when it comes to the offense that's taking place? Spiritually, I think that we have to address this. Can we give it up for Satan right here? Okay, thank you, Satan. (laughs) I appreciate you, man. You got real comfortable. You really became a good actor. Good actor. I appreciate you. You can have that. You can have that. (laughs) We have to be careful that we do not give the enemy a foothold. And as a Christian community, I think that it's important to take moments of pause and to address something when it comes to the spiritual realm. We can't fight on the physical realm. That God has given us, the scripture calls weapons of warfare. Those weapons of warfare is prayer and intercession. It's really interesting as I got closer and closer to this topic of being offended that I could not move forward in this conversation or in this particular feeling of being offended without continuing to stumble across the topic of forgiveness. And isn't it pretty radical, excuse me, isn't it pretty radical to think about the people that God calls us to forgive? Like the people who offend us, who leave wounds in our life. Maurice, you don't know what this person is doing. You don't understand the hurt that has taken place. But what if we were a different community? What if we did live differently? What if, coincidentally, the Bible called us to live in a radical way where it does not make sense in the way in which we forgive? It does not make sense to those around us because you are offended and there is hurt and yet you give forgiveness? I don't think we only have to recognize the enemy and the plan of the enemy in our life, and we have to have more conversations about that. I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but if Jesus has talked about an enemy, then I think every now and then we have to bring up that there is an enemy at play, and his tool is division. Whenever there is division and confusion and chaos, he's happy. He sits in the background, and he makes room in our life and in our hearts. 
Not only do we need to recognize that there is an enemy and he has a plan, but we must recognize our own need for forgiveness. If we're going to be a community that lives unoffendable, we have to recognize our own need for forgiveness. And let me be very clear, um, again, to be unoffendable is not to not be offended. Being offended is human, but staying offended is a choice. When we recognize our own need for forgiveness, what I love in his very own Pauline way, Paul is the writer of Ephesians, and he's writing this letter. As he's writing this letter to a broad audience, he addresses forgiveness. And what I love is that he points to the cross. He points to what Jesus has done for all of humanity. He points to the love of Christ, of what Jesus has done, and what Jesus has done was radical. What Jesus did on the cross and his forgiveness and his love towards all of humanity was radical. Nobody could ever think about it. It was unthinkable. Ephesians 4.32 in the message version puts it this way. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. What would it look like to be a community that recognizes when we are offended but radically forgives because we have been forgiven. Do we not know that what Paul is pointing and pressing us towards is that when you put your faith in Jesus, that the progression, that that understanding, that the forgiveness that you have received, that it was undeserved, that, that, that we didn't deserve it, we didn't work for it, we didn't do anything for it, and yet God forgives us and he lavishes his love on us and his grace and his mercy, and we don't do anything. And the Bible says every single morning his mercies are new every single day. Have we lost sight of our own shortcomings? Because when people around us offend us, let us be reminded that every day we offend a holy God, that we defend, that we offend a holy father. That every single day that we do not, we cannot do enough to earn the standard of what God has put in our life. And yet he destroys that by coming and loving us in spite of. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, he died on the cross for us. That he forgave us. This is radical because I think sometimes oh, the standard that we have is our Instagram friends. The standard that we have is those that are around us. You know what? At least we're not them. You know, this is, you know, like, I'm offended. I, I got some of my own shortcomings. I got some things that's going wrong in my life. I get it. Yeah. But, but those people, look at that. Like, like that's crazy. Like, you're, you're glad you have a sibling like me because look at their family rivalries. Like, at least we're not them. I know I got all my stuff that's going on. Look, look, I look, as, look you don't have that person as a husband. Look at that husband. And we don't ever want to address our own because we use the standard of those around us. But can I tell you that the standard is not those that are around us. The standard that God puts in place is what he did for us. One of the ways that I was thinking about this uh, was uh, freely we give, freely God has called us to give away. One of the ways in which this kind of came up for me. So when I came on staff here, I came here from California, and I actually came from a church where, um, you know, it was just, you know, storefront, maybe at max every so often. It reached about 200 people, 250 people. And um, it was just one of these things where on an average, though, it was about 50 people in the room. 50 people in the room, and the church budget was whatever my 19-year-old self had in my pocket. You know what I mean? And so Little Caesar's Pizza, $5, that was whatever the youth, that was what all the youth ate growing up. That was it. Little Caesars pizza, breadsticks, five dollars. That's all I had, okay? Moving here was fun because I recognized when I came on staff uh, that our church gave me a church credit card. I said, Oh, I don't have to spend my own money. So we set aside funds for a particular purpose when it comes to ministry things that take place in ministry events. So I would take out my high school leaders and we would go out to lunch or we would go out to dinner after, you know, um, uh, the high school night that we were taking place. And they didn't know this, but they, you know, we'd go out and, and uh, the bill would come around. And I love this moment. I love this moment where, you know, you just throw the card on the table, put it on one bill. I got it. You know, you're acting like it's, you know, they don't know though. They don't know, right? They don't know what card it is. No, it's okay. One bill, one bill. I got it. One, one, one bill. Put it on one card. I got it. I got it. 
And I let the feeling just like, you know, I kind of took in that praise and that glory for like a couple of seconds. Then the Holy Spirit convicted me like, boy, that is not your money. You need to tell them where that's coming from. And I said, it's okay, it's okay. The church has actually set aside some funds. Uh, so I'll take care of tonight. We love what you guys are doing. We're investing in us and the leaders and all the things that's taking place here. So we, I want to take care of you. I'll take care of tonight's bill. I'm giving away money, but it's not really my money. Can I tell you this morning when it comes to being offended that I call you, not me, God calls us to forgive because it's not really your forgiveness. The forgiveness that we receive from God flows from us to say that I should not be forgiven for all the things that I have done. And because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, because of his faithfulness in the midst of my unfaithfulness, I'll forgive. I'm offended and it hurts and it takes me to this place of wanting to isolate myself and to really justify all of my feelings and I'll never talk to that person and I'll put up fences and I'll gird myself up because I'll never let them in and you're defending yourself and you put up a whole fence around your heart and all of these things that's taking place. I get it, but can I tell you, God calls us to forgive our enemies, to love those who persecute us. Maurice, I am not about to love someone who persecutes me. I get it. It's radical. But what if we lived in a way where a faith community called Christians was different? That nobody, I don't understand it, but I'm giving this away because it's not mine in the first place. Forgiveness is something that flows through us because God first gave it to us while we were not worthy. Your greatest opportunity to be like Jesus is moments when you are offended yourself. Listen, when we talk about offense, not only do we need to recognize the enemy and the plan that he has, but we need to recognize the need for our forgiveness. Our forgiveness. Are you a person who needs forgiveness? Are you a person who recognizes that sometimes it's interesting that uh, we need forgiveness, but we are slow to give forgiveness? Like when we mess up, uh, forgive me, uh, uh, but, but when you mess up, you're canceled. Can I tell you the cancel culture that takes place in our world is not kingdom culture? That I know you want to write them off and I know you want to just tell them that they're canceled. I know that uh, when I'm offended equals you're canceled. Uh, well, that math does not ma add up in the kingdom of God. And I know that, that you want to hold on to that. I know you want to harbor that. I know it actually sometimes feels good when you kind of bring that to yourself and isolate yourself. But can I tell you that when you are offended and when you isolate yourself, that isolation breeds distortion. And you don't really have clear perspective and recognize I'm in need of forgiveness myself. And because God has forgiven me, those of you who are followers in the room, Christians in the room, I'm talking to you. You are called to forgive others. So here's what I want to do. I want to invite you. I want to have, a, I have an invitation for all of us. Colossians 3 tells us to make allowance for faults and forgive anyone who offends us. I told you I had two points and an invitation. Here's the invitation. Make allowance for those that are around us. When we make allowance for those that are around us and we forgive those around us, what Paul is saying here when he's writing this letter is he's saying walk around and keep some forgiveness in your pocket because you need to anticipate some foolish, foolishness that's going to happen. You need to anticipate some things that's going to go on in your world. You need to anticipate that coworker that's going to offend you. You need to anticipate these things that's going to happen. And can I just make it very clear for us as a faith community? When we walk around with Colossians 3, make allowance for each other's faults. When we anticipate foolishness, when we anticipate offense, when we anticipate humans to be human, we leave a little bit of margin we leave a little bit of margin to not allow someone that much power in our life that we have to be so girded up and hard in our hearts that we now defend ourselves in a way that is antithetical to the gospel. We make allowance for each other's faults. And I want to make it very plain, when we anticipate that there will be offense, it doesn't take away the wound, but I think it helps just a little bit. And in our world today, I think we need to recognize the rhythms and flows that we are not led by what is taking place in culture and different culture world wars that is taking place. 
What if we lived differently? What if we lived radically in a way where the division that the enemy seeks to bring in our world and in our communities, it doesn't happen in our homes? It, not when it comes to those who are followers of Jesus. Colossians 3 tells us to anticipate. What if we anticipated on another election cycle that's going to be coming up? What if we anticipated that family gathering that we know is going to happen? What if we anticipated that there's another Facebook post that's going to be posted that's going to upset me? What if we anticipated that a loved one is going to say something stupid? What if we anticipated that there will be offense? And when we anticipate that and we walk around with a little bit more forgiveness in our pocket to give away to those around us, it, it doesn't point to us, it points to a loving God. It points to a loving Father that how would you, how could you forgive somebody for such a thing? And yet, I don't know. Because offense in the kingdom of God doesn't make sense. Because we're called to forgive those around us. You know, what I would do for just one more time with my grandfather. I told you my grandfather was one that offended me. He walked around with that mask underneath his nose. My grandfather passed away in 2021. And it's a small thing, but in the ways of all of the things that would irritate me when it came to my grandfather, whether it was the mask or whether it was uh, the way he, he just talked about the world, what I would do just for one more moment uh, to talk to my grandfather with that mask on his chin the whole time, underneath his nose, and to look at him and to sit a little bit longer to embrace the moment a little bit longer because tomorrow's not promised. My invitation to us this morning is two simple questions. As you leave this place, I want you to think about who do you need to forgive and who do you need to ask forgiveness from? Take a deep breath because I feel that it's, that's a sting. That's a weighty one. That's, there's people that's going through your mind right now. There, there are certain ones who you're putting in your mind, and yet uh, you're suppressing it. Like, nope, I'll never go to that conversation. I'm not here to force you, but I want you to sit with this invitation because it's Jesus who invites us to forgive. Who do you need to forgive, and who do you need to ask forgiveness from? Would you bow your heads? Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for forgiving us. First and foremost, Lord, what you have done on the cross, your faithfulness, your love, your grace, your mercy, your justice in the midst of us who offend you every single day. You lavish your mercy on us every single day because you love us. You have drawn close to us. And may we encounter that forgiveness on a daily basis, may we see and sense the weight of that forgiveness that you give to us every single day. We stop and say thank you for that. And it is because of that forgiven people are called to forgive. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us so that we can live in a radical, radically different way and forgive those around us. Many of us in this room are offended, Lord. Would you comfort us? Would you be a comforter in this moment of that offense? And I don't know when that step of faith is going to happen, of forgiveness. But, Lord, would you just be with us in the process of the wounds of being offended, the deep hurt of being offended? You draw near to us, and we draw near to you this morning with the hopes that we can become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.